the toil and the heat of the day. After my troubles are past, after the sorrows are taken away, I shall see Jesus at last. He will be waiting for me. On his beautiful throne, he will welcome me home after the day is through. After the heartaches and sighing shall cease, after the cold winter's blast. After the conflict comes glorious peace, I shall see Jesus at last. He will be waiting for me. Jesus, so kind and true, on his beautiful throne, will welcome me home after the day is through. After the shadows of evening shall fall, after my anchor is cast, after I listen to my Savior's last call, I shall see Jesus at last. He will be waiting for me, Jesus so kind and true, on his beautiful throne. He will welcome me home after the day is through. Amen. Thank you so much for that. We're in Matthew today, chapter 5, while the children are dismissed to go back to their <coughs> to children's church. Matthew chapter 5. All right. I begin this message today with a question. Who are you really? Who you really are is not necessarily what everyone sees. Who you really are can be better identified with what you will do when no one else is around or what you would do if you have the opportunity to do so. Not long ago, there was a poll given to Americans. Uh, what would you be willing to do for $10 million? 25% would abandon their entire family. 25% would abandon their religious beliefs. 16% would leave their spouses. 7%, 7 out of 100, would kill a stranger for $10 million. 3% would put their children up for adoption. <laughs> I've seen some kids. I think I can pick them out. But today, I want to talk to you about integrity. Being who we really are. Being honest about ourselves. Integrity is the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles and uprightness. Now, the message we're going to preach today that we're going to read about here <coughs> is Part of the message Jesus is giving at the Sermon on the Mount, one of my pa favorite passages to preach from, Jesus has dealt with the commandment on murder. He has dealt with the commandment on adultery. And then in the passage we read today, he's going to deal with the commandment on lying. 
Lying is an absolute epidemic in our culture today. A lie has no legs. It requires other lies to support it. You tell one lie and soon you have to, you're forced to tell other lies to back the, that one up. Oh, but you say, preacher, I only tell little white lies. Well, the problem with little white lies is soon you become colorblind and are no longer able to say what is a little white lie or a black one. So, that really is a problem in our society. I'll give you an example of, a, of some commonly spoken lies, just to let you know how prevalent it is. See if you've ever heard any of these. The check is in the mail. I'm on my way. <laughs> That's a common lie, isn't it? I'll start my diet tomorrow. No, you probably won't tomorrow either, but that's one we hear a lot. Give me your number and the doctor will call you right back. Common lie. One size fits all. Leave your resume, we'll keep it on file. This hurts me more than it hurts you. Not really. Your table will be ready in a few minutes. Open wide, it won't hurt a bit. It's not the money, it's the principle. Common lie. I promise I won't laugh. <laughs> and on and on it goes. We could have a whole bunch of them that we understand. It's just common every day. It's so part of our vernacular, we don't even think about it anymore. Look at what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5. I want to start at verse number 33. The Bible says, Again, you have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, <coughs> for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. But let your communication be, yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. Father, I pray you'd help us understand this passage, and as we unpack it to help, to, to hear some things today, we can apply to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. When we deal with subjects like integrity, truth, honesty, we have to understand that that is a big problem in our culture today, and when we have a big cultural problem, it tends to become a church problem as well. And so, uh, as with all types of social challenges, the Bible deals with this subject of integrity. And I want to take a look today and see what Jesus says about it here. And uh, I want to look at the principle behind integrity, the practice of integrity, and then a problem we all have with it and how to solve it. Starting out here with the principle of integrity, Jesus is dealing with in this passage the case law that existed in his day. The law was based around the rule, do not lie, which is obviously, as you know, the ninth commandment, thou shalt not bear false witness. Their law said that if you lied, the seriousness of the lie depends on the vow that you took. So when people would make promises and vows, they would swear by something. The temple of God was, the, was the name, where really the name of the Lord dwelled, and the closer you swore... Uh, to what was the name of the Lord or the center of the temple, the more serious the lie. So if you swore by the name of God or the temple, you were, by essence, you were invoking the presence of God into your promise. The thinking then was that if you did not do this, the lie isn't as serious as if you did. Jesus deals with this, if you'll turn <clears throat> over a few pages to Matthew chapter 23. Keeping your finger here in Matthew 5, we'll come back to it, but Matthew 23, verse 18, Jesus again deals with this case law when he says, And whosoever shall swear by the altar, it is nothing. But whosoever sweareth by the gift that is upon it, he is guilty. Ye fools and blind, for whither is greater the gift or the altar that sanctifieth the gift? Whoso therefore shall swear by the altar, sweareth by it and all things thereon. Uh, he is making it clear, uh, verse 21, to and whosoever shall swear by the temple, sweareth by it and by him that dwelleth therein. Jesus makes it clear to say here that it is foolish to say, if I swear by this, then I'm really bound by it, 
but if I swear by this, I'm not so much, and so on and so forth. Why is that foolish? Well, he makes it clear God is everywhere. God is ever-present. He is the creator of all. Everything you think, everything you say, everything you do, God sees it all. There's no place in this world where God is not personally present. If we grasp that, it certainly will help us be persons of integrity. Now, Jesus said in verse 20 something shocking. It's not so shocking to us uh, who know the Bible and understand salvation, <clears throat> but I guarantee you this was very shocking to his listeners. We're back in Matthew 5, verse 20. Except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case <coughs> enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, this would be an astonishing statement to his hearers. One of the ways that you do this uh, exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees is to realize that God is everywhere. He's not just in the temple. He is everywhere. He's always in front of you. Now, if you're a Pharisee, this is a person who believes in self. A Pharisee was a religious person, and religious people put more faith in themselves than they put in God. But if you're a Pharisee and you think that you can earn your own salvation, you think that if you live a good life, God will owe you, you think that God owes you blessings because of who you are. Uh, you're the creme de la creme of society, religious society. How then, as a Pharisee, do you regard the law of God? Well, we see it all throughout the New Testament. It was a burden. It was constantly heavy and crushing on them. Uh, it was difficult. But you obey it because you're afraid of condemnation. That is your motivation. But what if you believe the gospel? What if you believe that you're saved by grace? What if you believe that you're saved not by what you do, but by what Jesus Christ has done? Now, do you live in fear of God? Well, we do. The Bible says in Proverbs all throughout, we need to have the fear of God. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. But it, it is a different form of fear. It's not a fear of condemnation it, or a fear of punishment. It's a fear of grieving Him. You want to please the Lord. Hey, when we get saved and we realize what Jesus Christ has done for us, when he delivers us from the power of sin, when he delivers us from the condemnation of sin, that makes us want to please him. And you know what the law does? The law shows us how we cannot grieve him, but how we can please the Lord. And so that makes it a wonderful thing. If you're a Pharisee, anything that reminds you that God is watching, that's defeating. But if you believe the gospel, the idea that Christ is always with you is exciting. It's a good thing. It's something to celebrate. It's not crushing. Why? Because you're with someone you love. It's a whole lot different than the way the Pharisees looked at God. If you love someone, <coughs> the thought of their presence is wonderful. I love my wife. I like spending time with my wife. Uh, I, being with her is a joy no matter what we're doing. In fact, there's nothing that I ever do in life that is not made better by her doing it with me. That's the type of relationship we have with our spouse or should have, even, even shopping. I don't like shopping that much, but I like shopping when I'm with her. Why? Because I'm with someone that I love and enjoy spending time with. So does the presence of God then remove our desire to do right? No, not at all. If you love somebody, and if you have somebody that you love with you, it does bring accountability. You don't want to grieve them. You don't want to disappoint them. This attitude of the presence of God is one of the major differences between religion and Christianity because of how we look at it. Religion is all about condemnation. Christ is all about love. The Bible says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Living the Christian life is not crushing drudgery. We have a loving heavenly Father. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> David, in uh, the uh, Psalms, he knew the comfort and the strength that's gained by the presence of God. Psalm 16, 8, I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is my right hand, I shall not be moved. David is not saying, I put God in that position. Rather, David is recognizing God is in that position. He's always before him. And he's saying that I'm recognizing because God is always with me. 
I shall not be moved. That, that really can tell us two things there. I don't want to do anything that I'm ashamed of later because he's right there. And yes, I'm bold and courageous uh, because I know uh, the one that loves me is right there with me. There is your secret to moral uprightness, integrity, because you know you're always before him. Do not swear by the throne. Do not swear by this or by that. You're always in front of God. And secondly, look at the practice of integrity. Verse number 37, Jesus says here, But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. So in this verse, Jesus tells us something about truth-telling in particular, integrity in general. Simply, he says, let your yes be yes and your no, no. Don't say yes over here and no over here. Don't say yes over here and live like no over here. Don't say yes to this group and no to this group. If you say yes, let it be a yes, and if it's a no, let it be a no. I believe one of the points Jesus is trying to drive home here is consistency. Part of integrity is consistency. Now, no offense to my good friend Howard over here, but I have never liked math, brother. I know, and we can still be friends, but I've, uh, he's a math professor, but I've never liked math. I remember for years, in, as I, early years of school, I, I didn't hate it. It was normal, adding, subtracting. But then I go to school one day, and it's about letters now. It's not about numbers anymore. Math should be about numbers, shouldn't it? But suddenly it's about letters. They want you to find the X. I read this one time, and it make, it's food for thought. What if math teachers are really pirates, and they just want us to find the X so they can get to the buried treasure? Something to think about. I was never good at math. In fact, there are three kinds of people in the world. Those who can count and those who can't. Amen? So, but those of you who remember math, you remember the integer? It's the whole number, not a fraction. The word integrity comes from the same word. Whole number, not a fraction. Uh, the, uh, a person without integrity is fractured. A person with integrity is whole, is the same. So let's look at the test questions here today. Do you say one thing, but do another? Do you say you believe one thing, but really you're thinking another? Are you one way in public and another way in private? Are you yes over here, but no over here? We're talking about integrity. We're talking about being whole. We're talking about being honest. We're talking about let your yes be yes and your no be no. Are you something different where you work than what you are at church? Are you different online than you are in reality? That's the principle Jesus is talking about here. A lack of integrity has with it its consequences. There's some problems that we encounter when we lack integrity. A lack of integrity destroys human relationships. Imagine a society where no one trusted anyone to keep a promise, where every leader was expected to lie, where every preacher was a moral fraud, where contracts were never expected to be honored. Imagine how the relationships in that type of society would deteriorate. Every time you engage a lack of integrity, uh, you are eating away at the fabric of your relationships, and it is a miserable way to live. Secondly, a lack of integrity destroys your identity. Every time you do anything that lacks integrity, you eat away at your identity. It brings us back to our original question, who are you really? There has to be a guiding principle in your life, something that always remains the same, a north star to your existence. Abraham Lincoln, during his administration, was under fire, especially during the Civil War. Though he knew he would mis be, make mistakes in office and know he wasn't perfect, he resolved that he's never going to compromise his integrity. 
He made this statement once, I desire so to conduct the affairs of this administration that if at the end I lose every friend on earth, I shall at least have one friend left, and that friend shall be deep down inside of me. He knew who he was, and he wanted to have integrity. When I have counseled with people who have <clears throat> lied about who they are for years, not only does it ruin their lives and relationships, but I, I will make the statement sometimes, I don't even know who I am anymore. And why is that? Because they lacked integrity. When you always do what is beneficial only to you, and you lie and cheat to do it, in the end, there's no you left. There's no testimony. Uh, your testimony is non-existent. Integrity is important for human relationships. It's also important for your identity. Thirdly, a lack of integrity destroys human dignity. If you don't have integrity, you violate human dignity. Now, what's so wrong about a lie? Well, when you lie to somebody, you're not allowing them to see reality. You're putting them at a disadvantage. Uh, you're turning them to, into instruments for your own purposes. At the very best, you're treating them as children, as children, and as, uh, you're treating them as objects at the worst. This is one of the dangers, by the way, of social media. It's one of the things that just terrify me about this uh, as social media becomes more and more prevalent in our generation. It's all about controlling your narrative. You have today, or we have, the technology where you can brand yourself. It doesn't really matter who you are or what you are. You can put whatever you want about yourself online. And you know as well as I do because you know people who are uh, on social media, and, and sometimes you'll see as they present the idyllic picture-perfect life, and you know that ain't what's going on in their life because it's not reality. It's about creating a reality and putting it on. Don't judge things by what you see on social media, but that's what we're moving toward these days. Best of all, on social media, no one uh, ha can see or has to see the extent of your brokenness. You can put out whatever you want. Joy Davidman, in one of her books, wrote this. There are the lies of gossip which make haters out of us. There are the lies of advertising which make money out of us. There are the lies of politicians who make power out of us. Every lie demeans, destroys, and violates the dignity of the person you're talking to. Number four, a lack of integrity puts you on a collision course with reality. No matter how <clears throat> we try to cover our own problems up, no matter how we try to rebrand ourselves, there's still a real world out there. This is the reason, or there is a reason why people say that honesty is the best policy. If you lie, and you lie continually, eventually in the long run, it will catch up to you. I'm just encouraging you today to have integrity. Be real. Be who you are. Do not endeavor to create a false reality about who you are. Instead of hiding your deficiencies, bring them to the cross. Let Jesus Christ forgive you and heal you and move forward from there. You see, if you uh, make a quote here, if you tell a big enough lie and keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it. Joseph Goebbels, Adolf Hitler's propaganda minister. The worst person that can believe a lie that you keep repeating is yourself. And often that can happen. Be real. Your words ought to always match your deeds. Uh, be real about who you are. Be honest with yourself. It's the best way for us to deal with our situations. I remember as a child, we sang this song. I don't know if you've ever heard it. Oh, your walk talks and your talk talks. But your walk talks more than your talk talks. So when you walk and you talk, remember your walk talks the loudest. We both walk and we talk. Let's make a match, okay? And so that's integrity. We don't uh, present one thing and really are another. Let's have integrity. Oh, but preacher, people knew who I really was. More people know who you really are than you might think. Just be honest. Have integrity. There's a great harm 
to putting on and putting forth a false front. A lack of integrity, a disconnect between what you say and how you act, it will catch up to you because integrity is more than just telling the truth. It's being the same in every area of life. Integer, integrity, wholeness. That's what we want to be. Integrity honors the Lord. And then Jesus goes on in verse 34. <clears throat> Here he says, swear not at all. When he says that, you might think he's saying you can never take an oath. In fact, I know I've heard many people uh, say it that way. Now that doesn't really track because the whole Bible is filled with covenants and oaths. Uh, it sounds to me like Paul took an oath in Galatians 1.20. Uh, presidents today take an oath. Nurses take an oath. Lawyers take an oath. I don't know how much good that does for lawyers to take an oath, but uh, they do so. Somebody said 99% of lawyers give the rest of them a bad name, and that could be true. Every federal employee is required to take an oath uh, to support and defend the Constitution. Here's what I think Jesus is saying here when he says, swear not at all, but let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay. There ought not be levels of truthfulness in your life. Oh, I got to do what I said there because I pinky swore. Or I don't have to do this because I didn't really swear to it or make an oath toward it. That's not how we ought to live as a Christian. Integrity is more than just telling the truth. Jesus says you don't need to make an oath. Let your yes be yes, and let your no be no. Now, and we've got to remember, friend, as a child of God, you're always under oath. He's always watching. He's always there. Everything you say should be as truthful as if you were swearing on a stack of Bibles in a courtroom. Other people might want to hear an oath, maybe one of those professions we mentioned there. And so, fine, take that oath, but... It shouldn't matter to you. Everything you say is under oath because God sees all that we are in his presence. You want to hear a convicting verse? This is, I warn you beforehand, this is convicting. This is kind of hurts to read this verse. Matthew 12, 36. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Did you get the gravity of that verse? Every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. We will be judged by our words. The average person uses thousands of words a day. Enough to fill a small volume every day. Enough to fill a giant library in a lifetime. We're accountable, the Bible says, for every idle word. Now, studies show that men speak 7,000 words a day and women speak 20,000 words a day. There's a reason for that. They have to repeat everything twice that we ha before we hear it. Amen? Amen, ladies? See, I'm on your side on that one. But no matter how many words you say, you're going to give account for them one day. When a person's arrested, the officers warn in the Miranda rights, that anything you say can and will be used against you. Now, the Lord warns us that our words can rise up against us. So let me ask again today, how are your words? Are they true? Are they kind? Are they uplifting? Do they help or hurt the situations in your life? Now, be honest, and you don't have to answer loud, but answer uh, in your mind here, but just honestly answer this question. If you knew that tomorrow everything you said would be recorded and put online for everyone to hear. Would you talk different? Would you treat people differently? I think every single one of us would say, yeah, we'd probably be a little more careful what we'd say if we know everything's being recorded. And yet that's what Jesus is trying to drive home here. How in the world can you not be a person of integrity? I'm always looking. I'm always watching. The Bible says in Psalm 94, 9, He that planteth the ear shall he not hear, and he that formed the eye shall he not see. Why are we so bad at integrity, knowing that the Lord sees all? Well, that brings us to the problem and the solution of integrity. 
Jesus said here, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. <clears throat> now that's interesting. That's verse 33. The Greek word for perform literally means to pay off. Pay your oaths. Now it may sound like a strange word used in that context, but remember, everything you say is like an oath. Jesus, I think, is telling us here that uh, to tell the truth, there's a cost involved when we tell the truth, and you have to pay that price. So often the reason we don't tell the truth is because if I tell the truth, I'll be paying a price for it. Think of it this way. Some of us are approval people. I would put myself probably in that category by nature. We're approval people. We, our self-image is rooted in the idea that people like us. Uh, we want to please people. We're nice people. Sometimes we think, if I tell the truth, that person's going to be mad at me. And we're not willing to pay that price. Or you could go to another group of people, control people. And that is a different type of thinking, but they need to keep control of things. They want to control how people see things. And sometimes they'll realize, if I tell the truth, I'll be at a disadvantage. You see, approval people don't mind being a dis at a disadvantage as long as people like them. Control people don't care if people like them as long as they're in control. In the end, all truth-telling carries with it a price. Uh, it destroys your self-image. It threatens what makes you feel secure in the world. How do we get to that place where truth is more important to us than self-promotion? I, again, and I'm not, I don't try, want to be a crusty old guy talking about social media. But we could go on and on and on about the destruction of social media in the fabric of our society and what it's done. And this is one of the areas in which it's done it. We are absolutely, uh, mo mo many or most posts of many people, are, they're just lies. They're lies. Things aren't like they're being presented, and yet it's so natural that we don't even think about it anymore. The Bible, as I mentioned a second ago, that verse that uh, every idle word that man speak, I think we could insert the word type in there as well. Every idle word that man types. We need to be careful. And so, how do we get to that place? In John chapter 18, Jesus is having his trial before the Sanhedrin. And the Bible says they hit him. They struck him. Somebody actually reared back and punched our Lord in the face, probably in the mouth, in the head. Can you imagine that? They hit him. And Jesus uh, responds to them and says, you hit me because I told you the truth. Later on, he's standing before Pilate in verse 37 of John 18. For this cause I came into the world that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Remember what Pilate's answer was? What is truth? Jesus Christ, when he went to the cross, was paying the price for telling the truth. He wasn't just paying the price because he told the truth. He was paying the price for our dishonesty, for our sin, because we don't tell the truth, and we deserve a penalty. He has paid the price to tell the truth, he has paid the price for our lack of truth-telling. But here's what's so fascinating. Why couldn't these moralistic Pharisees accept what he said? I mean, Jesus gave the truth. He taught the truth. He used Old Testament to do it. He spoke, uh, he agreed with the prophets. He didn't contradict anything God or the prophets said. Why couldn't the Pharisees grasp it when he taught it? Well, they couldn't pay the price for the truth. Why did they hit him? See, their self-image was, I'm a good person. And if your image or your belief sits in the fact that you're a good person, and someone comes along and destroys that self-image, like Jesus did, there is none righteous, no, not one. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. They had to come face to face with their sin and when someone comes to you with that truth, for you to acknowledge that truth, it's going to cost you something. And they didn't want to pay it. So they wouldn't accept the truth. Yet when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he gives us the opportunity for a new self-image, not based on our efforts, not trying to, uh, uh, that's not us trying to package ourselves a certain way. 
Jesus Christ died on the cross, that means he looked at your life, each and every one of you and me. He saw everything, both good and bad, and he loved you anyway. What a blessing for us now. We realize because Jesus died on the cross for us, at some point we have to come face to face with that truth as well that the Pharisees could not come face to face with. You are not righteous. You are not good. You are not worthy. You cannot earn your own way to heaven. Those are the type of things they could not face. And they had to recognize their religion wouldn't get them to heaven. And if you've ever accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you had to pay the price for that truth. You had to come to the point where you recognize, I know in me is no good thing. It's all on Him. Well may the accuser roar of sins that I have done. I know them all and thousand more, but Jehovah knoweth none. What a blessing. I'm clothed in Christ. He loves me no matter what. And that means I can handle the truth. Amen. I can deal with the truth and deal in truth. That means I can tell the truth about who I am. It means I can pay the price. If somebody doesn't like me, I can handle that because I'm in Him. I may not please everyone, but I'm loved by Him. I may lose control in certain areas, but I'm secure in Him. Jesus Christ paid the price to tell the truth. He paid the price for our lack of truth-telling. You are a Christian because of his integrity. Now I ask you today, how is your integrity? We gave, took some test questions a few minutes ago, but are you whole? Are you integer? Are you uh, fractured? Uh, do you play or, or take on different identities depending on where you are? It'll come back to you. It'll destroy your testimony. It'll hurt you inside. The Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Be who you are. Be honest about who you are. If you, have, <coughs> if you have issues that need to be taken care of, if you have sin that needs to be dealt with, bring them to the cross. Let Jesus Christ, 1 John 1, 9, if you shall confess with your sins, He is faithful and just to forgive your sins, and that would be great enough, but He doesn't stop there, and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Be a person of integrity. Be a person that is real, and uh, before God and honest before Him. Christ made a promise to go to the cross. He kept that promise. He was a man of integrity. That's why you and I can live. Set the Lord always before you as the psalmist, and then you can say along with Him, because He is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Be a person of integrity, and let God use that testimony to win and impact others for Christ. Let's have every head bowed, every eye closed. I don't know, dear friend, where this message is, how it's spoken to you. We covered a lot of ground. But I encourage you to be a person of integrity. If you're in here today and <clears throat> you say, Preacher, I don't know this idea of salvation. I don't know for sure if something happened to me, I'd be in heaven. I hope I would. But I don't know 100%. No one's looking around. No one's going to point you out. Would you just slip up your hand? Let me pray for you if you're here today. I'm not so sure. Would you pray for me? Thank you so much. Dear Christian, as you stand along with me, heads bowed, eyes closed, she's going to begin to play. Are you a person of integrity? Do you put on different hats depending on where you are? We need to be people of integrity. Altar's open if God spoke to you.
Thank you so much. You can look